Thank you for joining us in this webinar, the first in a series on the Aging Project, which I am proud to announce that ARM is releasing today on our website. Uh, today, we have two fantastic speakers with us to talk about one of the chapters of Aging. I will introduce them in a moment, uh, but first, let me introduce myself. My name is Michael Lemke. I'm the Director of Science and Industry Affairs at ARM. I'm going to share with you just some brief background on the project before we get started. I know that many of you are already familiar with this and even perhaps have contributed to it, but uh, I wanted to set the stage for you a little bit. So aging uh, and, and today's topic in particular will be on process development using quality by design principles. By way of background, aging is a project that ARM undertook starting several years ago after feedback from our members about some of the CMC issues that the field as a whole was experiencing. It occurred to us and our members at the time that these issues were not unique to cell and gene therapy. And in fact, some other segments of the biologics industry had gone through similar growing pains uh, perhaps before. Um, and the example of the, uh, the AMAB document was brought up as something that was instrumental and one of the things that really allowed uh, advances to occur in that industry in terms of improving manufacturing quality, optimization, not to mention driving down COGS. So that was the impetus for ARM undertaking the aging project. Uh, it is, as you will see, a, descri a description of a hypothetical AAV vector produced by a triple transfection process in an HEK293 cell line, importantly using quality by design principles. We're very fortunate at ARM to have uh, a large number of subject matter experts from our member companies. And I can tell you that um, there were many contributors on this over from over 25 ARM member companies. Uh, I also wanna thank Nimble who generously provided funding for aging, which allowed us to employ technical and medical writers um, without which we would not have been able to complete the project. Uh, this document is intended to benefit the entire field and we are placing it as open source on our website, effective today, at the link you see here. Um, if you're not able to copy this down, don't worry, you'll be able to find it on our website. You can reach out to me directly. Um, and we're also paying this on social media as we speak. So it will be very findable. Uh, these uh, educational webinars will initially be targeted for you and, and at you though, as, as our members. Why did we set out and what is the purpose of aging? Well, we, as I said earlier, we got feedback that there was a real need to establish best practices for process development in gene therapy. We think that this document will act as a, a tool for teams to communicate with each other. Uh, I, I know that many people are rapidly coming into this field uh, who have a lot of experience, but not necessarily experience in gene therapy manufacturers. So they may, understand QBD, but not the particular issues that we face with manufacturer of AAV vector. And on the other hand, there are uh, gene therapy experts who have never had the opportunity or have never had the chance to be uh, educated on QBD principles. So we hope that uh, this document will serve as a bridge between those groups and, and therefore a workforce development tool. And we also have the aspirational goal that uh, this will be used um, to, to help educate uh, regulators. This is what the contents of the document look like. Um, and if you're looking at this and seeing that we're on chapter four today, no, you did not miss uh, three webinars prior to this. Uh, aging actually isn't intended to necessarily be read front to back, although you're certainly welcome to do that, time permitting. Uh, each chapter, to an extent, stands on its own. Uh, although there is a common theme running throughout, as I described earlier. So in, in that way, you will be able to use uh, what you need from the document, that's, that's the intention. And we are starting with this chapter in particular, process development for QBD, uh, because it is a foundational chapter in the aging document. As far as the educational rollout goes, again, this is the first in a series of webinars, which will culminate 
and a half day workshop later on this year. And the full document will be available um, along with soon the individual chapters uh, on ARM's website. With that, I know you didn't come here to listen to me talk today. So I will introduce our two expert speakers. Uh, they are both from Ultragenics. Jesse Sun is here with us today, one of the contributors for chapter four. She has 10 years of experience in fermentation and cell culture in the pharmaceutical industry. She joined Ultragenics in 2019, where she's focused on AAV process development, scale up and cutting edge technologies, resulting in decreasing COGS. She also leads their CMC team. Prior to Ultragenics at Berger Ingelheim and GSK, she worked on and led process development for both early stage and late stage projects on monoclonal antibody or other therapeutic development proteins. I'd also like to introduce James Warren, Vice President of Pharmaceutical Development at Ultragenics. James is a biologics vaccine and viral vector product development executive committed to improving global human health by systematically driving the advancement of new and improved medicines through sound science, clear strategy, and broad collaboration. He has over 27 years of pharma and biotech industry experience and a broad background in early and late stage vaccine, viral vector, and cell therapy development. He's accomplished cross-functional CMC executive, supporting critical paths of licensure to vaccine, viral vector, and biologics programs. And with that, I will turn over to James first, who will start the presentation, the main presentation today. Thank you very much, Mike, uh, for that great introduction. Really appreciate it. And you know, um, I, I should note, in addition to a MAB that you mentioned earlier, um, it was really I was proud to be part of the AVAX case study uh, that was done about um, about eleven years ago or so uh, as a follow up to AMAB. Uh, so it was really fantastic to participate. In, in this initiative. So just as a matter of introduction and, and you know, um, maybe we can go on to our legal disclaimer uh, first and, and then we'll, we'll go on to the next couple of slides to the agenda where we are talking uh, first about gene therapy background. So um, next slide, please. As a matter of introduction, we're talking today, as Mike said, about applying quality by design principles to gene therapy. And, and more specifically in this webinar, we're talking about applying QBD to an adeno-associated viral vector production process. Uh, so this slide shows that over the past 20 years, we've seen really a significant increase. And in this case, really up to tenfold increase over the past 10 years or 20 years uh, in annual clinical trials initiated, initiated globally using AAV vector products. And over the last 10 years, we've primarily, primarily seen these clinical trials focused on the application of AAV products to treat monogenic disease indication. And the reason for that is really some significant advantages of using AAV vectors in gene therapy. And those are all listed there, but you know, uh, talking about long-term gene expression, encouraging safety profile, you know, there are many, many serotypes, uh, multiple manufacturing platforms, which we'll, we'll discuss. Uh, the fact that the product itself is, is physically robust and, and is uh, you know, able to withstand harsh treatment and, and really, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, uh, really no significant adverse, advance, uh, adverse events in clinical trials directly attributed to AAV. Uh, with respect to disadvantages, um, small cloning capacity, uh, manufacturing challenge with respect to historically low titers, and again, we'll talk about this, and, uh, you know, vulnerability to pre-existing immunity uh, you know, uh, reduces uh, some uh, clinical effectiveness. So uh, next slide, please. So whereas most of the work currently being done on AAV gene therapy is really in early stage of clinical development uh, or IND enabling development, we're talking today about how to approach late stage uh, or BLA enabling development for AAV products. And you know, if, if you envision more of a risk-based approach uh, to late-stage development, 
there are in many ways, many similarities of how we approach AAV product development uh, relative to how we do it in biologics and vaccines. And, and one example is as we go toward uh, the end of the development phase, it's really important to be able to characterize uh, the process prior to your process performance qualification, understanding the links between product and process quality, process and product quality, uh, defining various acceptable and nor normal operating ranges, defining those critical and key parameters, which enable uh, process performance qualification and really enable the production of product that maintains high level of uh, the quality attributes uh, that are desired. So, um, you know, the other similarity is with respect to a process and analytical control strategy, you know, it's, it's extremely important that, uh, you know, uh, various risks and specifics of the platform are taken into consideration when establishing this control strategy. And we're gonna talk about this much later in the webinar. And then later on, uh, and, and as, as is the case with, you know, many other modalities, uh, it is really, really important for us to maintain a very vigilant eye toward comparability when implementing process changes. So next slide, please. So within the scope of establishing a risk-based development approach that is really fit for purpose and appropriate considering the AAV gene therapy modality and, and, and also the application toward rare disease indications. We can also discuss, uh, again, from a risk uh, perspective or, or a, a risk tolerance perspective, how are AAV products different, right? So again, we talked about multiple manufacturing platforms, right? The, the various uh, types of, of approaches that we can use to manufacture these products directly impacts how we formulate uh, and compile the control strategy. So this is, this is very important. Um, as is the case with many viral products uh, for AAV gene therapy products, viral vector products, um, full structure function characterization is not fully understood for all of the attributes of the product. So this leads to really complex and potentially variable uh, you know, connections between the, uh, the, 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 the attribute of the product and, and the actual structure of the product. So we do have a number of opportunities for taking a risk-based approach uh, with respect to characterization. Um, you know, it's, it's really important to do some of the risk assessments that we're going to go into detail about later on in this webinar, uh, making sure that we're really targeting only the most critical parameters and limit the scope of experimentation, which otherwise could be fairly daunting. Uh, from a viral clearance perspective, and, and, and in this case study, we're talking about a, not, uh, you know, a process that does not involve a helper virus, right? So this is a transfection-based uh, case study. So you know, um, one can imagine that a robust risk assessment could be implemented in lieu of a formal viral clearance study, particularly for phase one to phase three. And with respect to starting materials, right? Again, we're, we're talking about transfection, um, you know, uh, you know establishing a streamlined path to qualifying uh, the plasmid process is really very, very important. So as opposed to fully, uh, characterizing and qualifying uh, the, the plasmid process, what is really most critical is to be able to understand the link between variability in the plasmid quality and how that impacts the vector process performance. So uh, next slide, please. Brings us back to the agenda. And so over the next couple of slides, we're going to outline the typical flow of early and late stage development and where and how we can and should incorporate elements of QBD. And, and really this is the best place to start. And this slide attempts to summarize the major activities associated with early and late stage development and, and trans, transition, the transition to commercial manufacturing. Uh, the boxes highlighted in green are the areas that we will spend most of our time talking about later on in this webinar. 
So from top to bottom, we're talking about uh, bringing products from uh, discovery research into uh, process and analytical development, and then down toward the bottom, eventually toward commercial manufacturing. What are the major major activities that are ongoing uh, during that that transition? So. Uh, as we begin thinking about taking quality by design and implementing quality by design principles towards uh, the development of a AAB product, uh, one of the most important things is to establish the quality target product profile. And you know, I, I cannot overemphasize the importance of the QTPP because establishing the QTPP and and the next step, which is you know the critical quality attributes are so important to managing change during development. So we talked about multiple manufacturing platforms associated with making these products. And it's, it's very, very common initially to start off with a, um, a, a research-based process during the talks or phase one level of development. And then upon uh, realizing the need for scaling, transition to a completely different manufacturing platform and, and really being able to define early on in the product development life cycle, this quality target product profile and these CQAs enables you to manage comparability across product or process changes. Uh, so again, today we're going to talk about as we progress from research into the early stage and, and even late stage process development, um, you know, we're talking about moving in toward, uh, you know, process performance qualification uh, prior to commercial uh, defining a commercial manufacturing process. So we're going to talk about things like scale down model qualification, parameter risk assessments, what, what uh, elements of the parameters have the most direct impact on the quality attributes of the product. Uh, then going, going ahead and, and characterizing that process, defining normal operation, uh, normal operating ranges, acceptable operating ranges, um, taking step further and, 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 and um, uh, you know, identifying, classifying the parameter criticality uh, between uh, key and, and, and non-key and critical parameters. And being able to put that and, and, and pull that all together uh, in, in compiling a comprehensive process and analytical control strategy prior to going into your commercial manufacturing. So we have another slide. The next slide uh, shows a, a little bit more granularity, um, some of the activities and some of the elements, um, uh, the, the, the risk assessments, some of the specific risk assessments that we take on the path to uh, late stage development. So again, we have on the left, we have um, the, some of the, the preclinical activities. Uh, then we have in the middle, we have more early stage activities than late stage activities transitioning into commercial. And again, similar to the last slide, we have QTPP and CQAs being established as early as possible. Um, really QTPP is an exercise that should engage cross-functionally research, uh, preclinical process development, analytical development, many other functions. Uh, with respect to early stage uh, process development and analytical development, um, the critical quality attributes risk assessment is going to be a key activity in order to really lock in your CQAs and your potential CQAs. Uh, at this point in time, we're also in process of, of perhaps scaling and optimizing the process, improving yield, and, and really defining your phase one and two manufacturing campaign. Uh, as we transition into later stage process development, again, we're going in, we're focusing in on the PRA, the parameter risk assessment, material risk assessment, and we're putting together a plan, a PCP, a plan for process characterization using various risk assessments such as FMEA to drive parameter criticality assessments. And, and these are going to be, again, pulled together as part of the, uh, you know, defining the final process and analytical control strategy. Um, and then obviously, as we go into um, uh, stage two, as defined by FDA guidance, uh, and then we head into process performance characterization, um, the process uh, should be very, very well characterized and 
uh, ready uh, for commercial manufacturing. So next slide, please. So we're going to get a little bit more into the critical quality attributes and might as well just go ahead and, and animate this slide all the way through. And um, this slide talks about some of the um, particular product attributes that are driving the, the, uh, uh, the quality and the effectiveness of these AAV products. And we're talking about um, when you take a look at an adeno uh, associated viral vector product, uh, it's made up of uh, a capsid that composed of three different proteins, VP1, 2, and 3, that are expected to assemble at a certain ratio. Um, you know, we, are, we should be able to measure the titer of total AAV particles. Uh, a subset of those total particles are going to be uh, filled with a single-stranded genome. So a fraction of those are going to be genomic particles. Um, within those genomic particles, a fraction of those particles are going to be infectious particles. That is, particles that can uh, bind to a target cell, uh, transduce that target cell, translocate to the nucleus, uh, and um, you know, uh, uh, move forward to uh, transcribe and, and translate the, the gene that's carried along with the vector product. Um, so, so that needs to be all those uh, aspects of the transduction process need to be characterized and we need uh, specific analytical methods to do all of this. And then, you know, we know also that AAV particles are prone to aggregation. So we need to come up with, uh, you know, analytical methods that can help us characterize uh, from a biophysical perspective, uh, the size of these particles. So, uh, and then last but not least, uh, with respect to potency, um, you know, there are many different ways of measuring potency with AAV products. And early on in the development, we stick to primarily expression-based potency measures, whether that's either mRNA or, potency or, or protein expression. Uh, but later on, uh, toward uh, the later phase of product development, it's very, very critical for us to establish uh, transgene product functional activity assay. And depending on the complexity of the transgene product, this may wind up uh, being uh, a matrix of various methods uh, which are able to measure the specific activity or one particular activity of the transgene product. So next slide, please. So let's talk about the, one of the first risk assessments that we do for these products, which is our critical quality attribute assessment. And essentially what we're looking at is severity and uncertainty. And again, if you go back to AMAB and AVAX, this is the same approach that, or a very, very similar approach that we used uh, as we defined uh, those case studies. But in looking at the severe, severity of the effect, we're charting this, uh, we're ranking this from uh, low to medium to high. Um, and uh, this has to do with whether or not the product uh, is going to have an impact on safety, efficacy, immunogenicity. And you know, obviously, um, increasing levels of severity of the effect are going to uh, correspond to a, an increasing number from one to three to 10. With respect to uncertainty, uh, we're defining uncertainty um, based on our prior knowledge, right? So uh, what is our prior history with the product, with the platform in some cases? Um, what evidence can we glean from uh, preclinical studies with respect to uh, how critical that particular product attribute is to uh, function in uh, preclinical studies? And finally, uh, if there is any uh, clinical uh, data that we can use uh, to assess uh, the, the, uh, the criticality of the particular attribute, um, we will incorporate that. So, um, you know, looking at the, the box in the upper right, uh, this leads us to the final matrix that allows us to rank both uncertainty and severity and essentially establish a, a waterline, so to speak under which, uh, over which you have a certain number of, of critical 
uh, uh, attributes that are that are highlighted in red, and under which you have a list of potential potentially critical quality attributes that are going to require more time and more data to define later on in the product development. So, next slide, please. And this is just a, uh, a visualization of many of the quality attributes uh, listed that we measure uh, for AAV products. And you know, these are um, microbiological attributes, uh, product impurities, process impurities, uh, different aspects of product quality, appearance, osmolality, pH. Uh, we're talking about biological uh, content, that's gene copy or viral particle number, as we discussed earlier, uh, biological strength in terms of the, the infectivity of the product, uh, and then potency, as we discussed uh, in the last slide. Um, and you can see how you know, th there could be a transition in the way we test or measure these methods from early stage into late stage, uh, going into more sophisticated methods, more biophysical methods, maybe incorporating some mass spectrometry, uh, droplet digital uh, PCR, uh, which is now becoming essentially the standard across all uh, product development. Um, and of course, uh, various aspects of potency measurements. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Jesse Sun for the rest. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Jim, uh, for introducing the landscape of the QBD uh, idea. Uh, and I will pick up the topic from our uh, parameter risk assessment uh, Jim touched up, uh, upon earlier. So can everyone hear me okay? I guess no complaint, uh, it is okay. Then Not just... clear. <laughs> Thank you, Mike, for confirming. So um, on this slide, the Chevron just remind us where the parameter risk assessment lies in during the whole QBD uh, process. Um, so it is right after the CQA assessment and it is one of the prerequisites for process characterization. And of course, uh, <clears throat> later on the control strategy. The rationale for um, <clears throat> process parameter risk assessment, I will call it PRA for short, <clears throat> is to evaluate the correlation of the input uh, parameters for each unit of operation versus a uh, performance indicator or, pro uh, or pro uh, product quality attributes. And high risk parameter or certain uh, medium risk parameters, and also the parameters with limited knowledge will be studied in process characterization. So for the method, normally uh, people use fishbone or cost-effective matrix, which I will show uh, in the next slide. And I think for the input and output, I already kind of uh, commented on uh, in the rationale already. So this is a table uh, you will also see on the uh, chapter four uh, in uh, aging. So basically this is the first uh, few columns uh, show the parameter in certain unit operation or process step. And then the next view is about the, uh, the set point and also, also the range for uh, this uh, risk assessment. And this range could also be potentially used for process characterization. Uh, the next few columns are either process indicators or CQAs relevant to this process. For example, VCD for upstream and yield for downstream. Uh, and the last two columns for maximum scoring and uh, some of the scoring is for uh, analysis to really draw the waterline for uh, high or medium risk parameters. So uh, this is a system we used or the criteria used for uh, risk ranking. So for performance uh, uh, indicators, we have one for seven to indicate no impact, minimal to moderate impact or severe impact. Uh, for uh, CQA, we actually use one for 10 because we wanna give a higher, uh, a more weight on the CQA impact during our assessment. Uh, of course, this is just a one way of doing it. Uh, definitely you can, there are other systems existing, but this is just one example uh, we're sharing in the book. Uh, there are a few examples for upstream and downstream. Uh, I will just uh, cover a couple uh, here. So for example, for the soil stage, uh, if the temperature is set up at uh, 37 with a range of 36 and 38, it's also pr pretty narrow range. So, and also this is a very early step of uh, upstream process uh, and the cell growth will be recovered in the following step. 
So the impact on the cell growth for VCD and viability is really minimal. So that's why we put a four here. And because this is such an early step, uh, the impact on um, quality is, is, is almost none. So that's why you see one here. So overall, the max on the scoring will be four and um, the sum of all the number will be uh, 11. Uh, the same temperature for at the production stage However, at a wider range, for example, 35 and 39, there's a wider range and we'll see much bigger impact on VCD viability and the tighter because this is a production stage. Uh, and for, for this, this range, it is uncertain uh, about the product quality. So that's why you see four. And uh, for, for absolutely no impact on a certain product quality, you will see one. And for knowledge that we already know, for example, the PR ratio in the transfection stage, we already know it's gonna impact MT2 for ratio. So you will see a 10 here. I do see audience ask about the uh, raw material. So I may just speak a, a, a few words more about here. So basically for specific for PI uh, quality, uh, you see a lot of force because this is really confounded by all the plasmids we use. So it's very difficult to separate them unless we study them uh, particularly. Uh, however, uh, we did put a, a seven in tighter because prior experience show lot to lot difference uh, at a kind of lower grade of PEI could result in, um, in impacting the tighter. Uh, so uh, I will actually skip downstream for now, but, uh, but in the book chapter, there are actually descriptions for those examples as well. Uh, and uh, uh, this graph shows analysis of the PRA we just did. Uh, so the X axis uh, shows the 260 parameters we assessed for upstream. And uh, for the uh, left axis, this is the sum of the ranking and for the right, right hand side, this is the maximum of the ranking. So each uh, orange bar represents the max of the ranking. Uh, so, so you will only see one, four, seven, ten for the orange bar, and the black line uh, refers to the sum of the scoring for each parameters you see for the two hundred and sixty uh, parameters here. Uh, and you also see the the uh, red line and the green line representing uh, the criteria we have for high risk and medium risk. So basically, everything above the red line will be the high risk. And anything below uh, will below the green line will be a low risk uh, parameter. And the table summarized uh, what I just said uh, just now. So basically, if a parameter with either a max of ten or a sum over and uh, equal to forty, uh, that will be a high risk parameter. And we have thirteen of those, uh, including four from the material. And for the medium risk, it's about twelve. Uh, and uh, uh, the medium and high risk is about 10% of the total parameter we assessed. So if we're only going to characterize, for example, high risk, that's only 5% of the, all the parameters uh, in the whole process. We're saying that this is really a great tool if we want to um, focus our effort on the limited scope on the most critical parameters uh, for, for, under, for the process understanding. So uh, this slides to share uh, the high risk parameters uh, from the upstream uh, process development and also uh, sorry for the P upstream PRA. And uh, you also see similar things uh, in the next slide for uh, downstream. So uh, the SF and uh, uh, FF here means short fuel and the full fuel. Basically at the two stage of uh, production uh, stages, you see uh, temperature and the pH. Uh, in both cases. And also there are some excursions or some temperature change during full fuel of the bioreactor. And of course, uh, transfection as one well of the critical step, the mixing time and the stat static incubation time is also considered a high risk after the PRA. Uh, in here, it is also listed uh, the potential impacted performance indicator and quality attributes. Uh, and this is fairly a short list. And also we do have some media uh, risk parameters list here that will expand into uh, VCD, uh, dissolved oxygen, and some other uh, excursions and uh, agitation, et cetera. 
Uh, and this slide shows uh, the parameters we have for, um, for the pure fish step. So they are divided into different unit, oper unit operation, and you can see how many parameters are listed in here. And also for the potential parameters uh, related, uh, sorry, potential uh, quality attributes and the indicators they are going to impact it, it is also listed in here. And uh, we also have a high, uh, a long list of the medium risk parameters for downstream as well. So you can see how many numbers are here. Uh, and I will actually move to the scale down model. Uh, we all know the parameter risk assessment is a kind of prerequisite for the process characterization. However, process characterization need to be carried with a qualified scale down model. Uh, so those are three examples of uh, what are the considerations when we're trying to develop or qualify a scale down model. Uh, one, one, the first one is a sea train and shake flask. And the purpose of the steps are to accumulate biomass uh, for the production stage. Uh, and uh, it is not necessary or to have a SDM. Uh, the reason is for some of our process, we are using uh, exactly the same uh, step as we have in commercial or large scale. Uh, for example, the soil stage or the initial fuel shake flask, you will follow exact the same uh, step as we have uh, in, in clinical runs. And uh, secondly, because the, uh, the different sets of shake flask or even different size or different brand of wave, they are accepted to be uh, interchangeably. Uh, in the industry as well. Uh, and the second example is for the production. Uh, so in here, the production of course is to getting the AV at that stage. Uh, and we, we use three liter, it can be like a two liter or even 10 liter depending on, on your platform. Uh, and uh, the, S, the SDM or the parameters can be set up according to the large scale. And they are just a list of the PI or CQA we need to qualify, for example, cell growth, tighter, some impurities, and just to make sure we are still making the same product at small scale. Uh, as for affinity, uh, the purpose is to purify um, the product and also with high yield. So we're actually using a smaller uh, diameter column in this step and AC, HCP uh, gen genome copies and other upstream introduced uh, purities are also making sure uh, that they can be cleared out at this step. Uh, quickly, I will show you a case study for uh, upstream SDMQ. So uh, on the left-hand side, you will see uh, the VCD, viability, and diameter. All of them are normalized and either with AQMS treated or no AQMS treated. So the green bar shows the SDMQ. I believe that's three wrong with a fairly narrow uh, arrow bar here. And, and the other colors are actually a larger, representing larger scale. So basically they all align very well. And also when we look at the tighter, there's no st uh, statistical difference among the scales. Um, and uh, in here, we actually did not use the toast yet because the N are fairly small. But when we uh, expand more numbers for both tighter and the product quality, we are considering to switch to two one sided T testing later on. Uh, here are some more uh, uh, kind of examples or more quality attributes. We're thinking whether they should be included or not to be included in the upstream uh, SDMQ. Uh, for example, replication competency, I think it is no, because uh, whether it is the final product will be re uh, replication competent is mostly determined by the design of the plasma or design of, of the product. It's not really upstream or even downstream uh, process relevant. Uh, and also safety quality, for example, endotoxin, bowel burden, et cetera. And again, this is not really process relevant, but more pro uh, material or facility uh, relevant. Uh, the full percentage from AUC, uh, we are actually considering to include that into the upstream um, scale down model qualification. The reason is uh, actually both upstream and downstream could contribute to the percentage of full. Uh, and uh, 
with the high and the medium uh, risk uh, parameters and a qualified scope down model, now we move to the char process characterization. Uh, I will start the process character characterization with the design that we could use uh, in the study. Uh, for OFAT, that's one factor at a time. Uh, we can only tell main effect only. And the example can be harvest timing because we can take samples early or we can extend the control condition run to a later time to get the timing. And also for downstream is the buffer volume. Uh, screening can, I think this is more related to uh, a fractional factorial design. So this can tell some main effect with some interaction. However, it may have a low resolution. But when we have a lot of uh, factors in either upstream or downstream, this is a great tool to start with. Uh, and then the RSM. Uh, for RSM, it can tell main effect and interaction, and it can include projected term. Uh, comparing to the uh, screening, it has a higher resolution. Uh, however, you probably cannot do six factors at the same time uh, with, a same, with a fairly uh, small amount of experiment. Uh, DSD is also another uh, tool that can tell main effect and, and interactions. But one thing is DSD cannot be used in all situations. For example, I believe categorical uh, factors cannot, cannot use DSD. Um, I think I will talk more in later examples uh, for DSD and, uh, uh, and the CCD. Uh, excursion and linkage study are pretty uh, straightforward. Uh, so yeah, so I think I will just skip those. Uh, so the first example is about the DSD. Uh, so it really allows the screening for a large number of factors in a small experiment. In our case, uh, this can be used for process optimization or characterization. In here, we just use title for uh, illustration. And in these cases, four factors are listed in here, including add to trans ratio, cis to trans ratio, total DNA, and PI to DNA ratio. And all the ranges are normalized to the uh, set point. So you can see how far we go. Uh, and on the right-hand side, this is the analysis of the effect sum summary. As you can tell, uh, we can do both um, uh, main effect and also uh, some of the uh, interactions as well. And uh, this is 17 conditions only uh, compared to the factors we are, we are going to have. So for each factor, you will be two level with a center point. So essentially, for each factor, we can tell three levels here. And this is just prediction profile for you to find the kind of the best title in this case. Uh, the second example will be uh, the CCD or response surface design. Uh, so in this case, we only have two factors, that is pH and temperature. Um, and uh, the control axial point counter point are corresponding to the figure here. Uh, we actually don't have a hybrid point, uh, but uh, I think the factorial point is also asso is associated with counter point here. Uh, as you can, you probably will notice for pH, we actually, for both pH and temperature, we actually have five levels uh, for each uh, factor. So I think that is kind of the beauty of the CCD. So I quickly kind of move to uh, the analysis of the titer. Uh, so this is kind of the response surface you see, and this is a pH and temperature, and the uh, Z axis is the titer. Um, and this is the ANOVA we see here and the effect test that we have here. I just want to point it out a couple of things. First of all, uh, the, the pH projected term uh, is significant and also temperature shows significant impact on titer. Uh, and um, we, did in, we also include the temperature projected term, but as you can tell, it's not like a lower than 5% uh, on p-value, but we still, uh, we take it out and add it back on. So we still decided to leave it in because this can significantly increase the R square, uh, the adjusted R square in here uh, and improve the model accuracy as well. And also in this case, we did look at the interaction profile and also even in the analysis, it doesn't show the interaction is critical. And now we're moving to the output of process characterization. 
we all know the purpose of the PC is really to find the proven acceptance range is actually the range within the uh, green bar. So uh, for the normal operating range is what we can control in the uh, in the uh, commercial or, or in the large scale or GMP side. So the, the idea is for the process control, we want the normal operating range well within the PRA or proven acceptance range. Uh, and also the knowledge range, or sometimes um, it is also including edge of failure as well, but I don't think the uh, beyond or, or um, having edge of failure is required by FDA, but the PRA and normal outing range, they, those are required. Uh, and now I'm just moving towards to the uh, parameter criticality classification. In here, I gave two examples of uh, two decision trees for either quantitative versus uh, qualitative here. So, uh, and in both cases, we have three levels uh, of uh, criticality of parameters. So if for the PC, uh, for the results we have from, from PC, if it is uh, significantly impacted on CQA, we may want to be careful because uh, sometimes sometimes it may have a, a st statistical impact. For example, if you have a purity 99% versus 99.9% .9 with a high hypersensitive uh, method. However, that 0.9% may actually not make a practical significance because even the 99% is considered pure enough for, for that step. So you are wanna go also check whether that statistical significance is also practical significant. If the answer is yes, it is a CPP. If it is not significant, then the next question we're gonna ask is, does that impact uh, performance? And if the answer is yes, it's a KPP. If not, CQ, if neither CQA or performance is impacted, you'll be a non-key. So even for uh, the non-PC driven uh, assessment, you will actually follow the same uh, idea, just the uh, impact on CQA versus impact on uh, process performance. Uh, and the last thing I want to cover is the process analytical tool PAT here. So PAT is really used to, to design, uh, analyze, and uh, control the manufacturer process by timely uh, measurements of either clinical attributes or it could be process uh, indicators. And this is to help to ensure the final product quality. Uh, just kind of echo with Jim's early presentation, you know, there is a part for both upstream and downstream. Uh, for AAV, we actually shared with the cell culture or vaccine, um, <clears throat> vaccine part. So for example, for the cell culture uh, or purification step, we use Raman or DLS. We can continue to, to uh, leverage those experience uh, for AAV gene therapy. However, for the gene therapy process, we do have unique uh, critical steps that we need to develop new PAT tools. Uh, for example, the triple transfection uh, part. So for that part, uh, we will need, I think having a PAT tool to monitor or even control that process will be beneficial for both productivity and the product quality. Uh, and this slide is really just for illustration purpose only. I'm showing a uh, transfection complex moni uh, monitoring using a PAT tool. Uh, so for those two figures you see, uh, that is testing uh, the same process, but different experiment at different time. This is exactly the same condition. You can see uh, the y-axis is the size of the particle and the y-axis is time. I think it's uh, about 30 minutes in both cases. And you could see the distribution and the size is fairly similar. So that really demonstrates the repeatability. When we test the same condition, you will continue to give us the same uh, size and the same dynamics. And we also have an example when we test a very different condition. Uh, this is actually kind of a bad condition that we, we have really low titer. And in this case, you could tell for the 20 minutes time, we actually started with a, a with different si sizes and also the, uh, the homogeneity is also different than our control condition. 
Uh, of course, size is only one part of we, we look to, and we all know the size of the transfection complex is very important to productivity. But we do also look at decay time, PDI, and we also have other uh, PAT instrument. Um, for to monitor this process as well. Uh, kind of for advice testament, we are going to have a PAT poster in the coming VPS presentation as well. So if you're interested, you can just uh, keep an eye on that. So uh, there are also other examples of PAT uh, methods and application. Um, those are actually listed and uh, well described in the book chapter. So I will just uh, skip for now. Uh, with saying that, I can't. I want to close my uh, presentation with the following kind of take-home message. Uh, the first is the gene therapy are really moving with accelerated rate uh, towards to late stage and BL BLA enabling activity. We could really borrow and learn from the biologics and the vaccines for the QBD experiences. And uh, secondly. Uh, establishment of the process of performance understanding and also have an in-depth understanding of the product quality could really help us to ensure a robust and re reproducible uh, production. Uh, and also uh, for the QQBD session, various risk-based approach can be used uh, as, as going through the whole uh, section, uh, Jim started to talk about CQA assessment and we have the PRA uh, ending with a few like 10% or less uh, parameters we can carry up through um, PC study. And also, uh, which I did not talk about here is a, a FMEA because through FMEA, if we know which parameters are critical and we can really increase the detectability well reduced occurrences could also help us to deliver a quality product uh, process. And finally, uh, with the implementation of PAT into our pro process, uh, either with a unique uh, process or with you know common shared experience versus the biologics could really help us to obtain real time information for process control. Uh, with that, I think I would like to thank Mike and uh, ERM before inviting Jim and I to this uh, webinar and share uh, our experience about the QBD for gene therapy. Thank you, everyone. And, and thank you all for your attention as well. And thank you, Jesse. And you're quite, uh, you're always welcome uh, at ARM and ARM events. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation. And I wanna thank both of you again for your contributions to aging. We, uh, we have some time for some audience Q&A, so feel free to enter questions in. I'll also, time permitting, we're gonna have a quick pop quiz at the end. So audience, um, don't drop off early because that's, a, that's an automatic F on the quiz if you do that. Uh, so let me ask a question first of, of Jesse. Um, so aging, as, as we discussed, is focusing on an AAV platform using a HEK293 uh, cell line. Could you comment on the application of QBD to some other platforms? Yeah, uh, that's a very good, good question. Uh, I think the backbone is really uh, similar uh, as actually for Autogenics, we also have Hila uh, platform. So I think the backbone is, is uh, highly similar. Uh, however, there are different focuses. For example, uh, we all know Hila will use the five, they probably will be uh, much higher requirement on the viral clearance and also even the analytical side, we want to make sure uh, that all the ad5 is inactivated and cleared throughout the process. The backbone is the same, but definitely different focuses. Okay, so in viral clearance, for example, there would potentially be a difference. That's something that's actually uh, discussed uh, in the upstream downstream chapter of aging, which we'll have a webinar in the coming months. Um, next question is about parameter classification. Is it appropriate to have a lower criticality assigned if a parameter can be controlled by automation? Uh, that's a that, that that's a great question. I think the uh, the short answer is is yes, but but also it kind of depends on uh, because the whole idea is to control the critical parameters uh, in the process. Uh, so if you are defining your criticality by SOD, by reducing your O and D could definitely help in control your process. 
Thank you. Uh, another question, what are your thoughts on assay variability during process characterization? Uh, TCID 50, the questioner cites as an example of a, a particularly variable assay. And what are some, uh, what are some things you do to, to deal with that? Yeah, I can take a stab at that, Mike. So um, Thank you. I, I, I think the, the you know, um, it's absolutely true that um, there are gonna be some um, measures, uh, and we, we brought this up earlier, right? Um, there are a number of different analytical methods that can be variable um, uh, for these products. What I can say is a few different things, right? Uh, I would significantly recommend that that organizations do what they can to improve the method as you go from early stage development to late stage development. There are a number of different things that can be done to improve the robustness and the re reproducibility of the method and understand really the, the sources of variability and do what you can to reduce or even eliminate that, right? But be that as it may, you're still talking about a cell-based assay that's gonna be prone to variability. So, um, you know, I, I think there's a few things I would recommend. Uh, number one, orthogonal methods, right? Uh, there should always be orthogonal methods so that, um, you know, uh, one signal does not drive, uh, you know, the decision on criticality. It could be a, a, a combination of multiple signals. The other thing, uh, which is frequently applied across the industry is just using replication, right? So if you have a, a method that's prone to variability, um, at, you know, a, a certain amount of replication is able to, um, and, and, and just taking a statistical approach across replicates can help you manage some of that variability. Thanks, James. Yeah, or, or the importance of orthogonal methods. Um, I think I'm going to have a T-shirt made with that uh, with that saying on it. Thanks for uh, thanks for that answer. Um, one more question we have here. Uh, it's a little bit of a tough one. At a very early stage of process development, would you already recommend applying QBD? And if yes, what would be the most practical approach if you lack prior process knowledge? So again, I'll take a stab at that. So I'm just reading the question here. At very early stage of process development, would you already recommend applying QBD? So I, I think there are elements of QBD, as we said, that are that are important to establish early on in the process. And again, not to be um, um, repetitive, but I think something on the order of the, the, the quality target product profile is something that can and should be done as early as, po as possible and involve input from clinical, preclinical research and process development. Um, and I think there are other risk-based approaches that are more uh, appropriate for later stages of development. Thanks, James. Um, so I know there's a, there's a few more questions. Uh, perhaps we can circle back to those after the event. I did want to get in at least one of our poll questions. Caitlin, could you put that up on the screen? All right, so there's actually two poll questions here. Uh, there is a correct answer for the purposes of, of this discussion. So these are not, these are not intended to be uh, opinion questions. Give everyone a few minutes and then we will post the results. Caitlin, if you just want to let me know when we have a decent number. Looks like uh, people are done answering Mike, so I'm going to put it live now. All right. So question number one, what is one of the main reasons to use risk analysis in AAV CMC development? Best answer, 74% of you are correct to target on-process optimization to have higher 
productivity. Uh, I, I understand why 26% because the regulators in internal quality systems require it. However, in, in this case, um, we're gonna submit that that's actually not the best answer, even if it's not incorrect. Um, second question, when should a process parameter risk assessment be conducted? It's a little bit of a trick question. It goes back to the earlier slide that showed the entire process. 83% uh, said before process lock. Um, actually, as we described the process today, it occurs right after process lock, uh, but before validation. And uh, fortunately, 0% of you said, uh, pick the last two options, which are not, not good options. Uh, so hopefully uh, that was informative for you and uh, you enjoyed the webinar. I encourage you to check out uh, in the coming months more uh, on aging and uh, thank you everyone. And thank you again, Jesse and, and James. Thank you, Mike. Take care.